our list and vision followers, but we wanted to hit our Facebook followers too, because everyone matters. So anyway, um, we wanted to say hello to everybody. We have a great show for you today. Unfortunately, Rick wasn't Rick Murphy wasn't able to join us this this week, but he will definitely be with us in March. So he sends his apologies. Yes. So, but today's show is definitely something that you all want to be a part of because we're going to talk about our um, follow up on some of our enslaved ancestors and how we have connected our family, how we've connected those families from generations back to the people today to ourselves. So why don't you start, Brian? Well, again, and I think a lot, a part of the show really is about the, I don't really want to say a sense of accomplishment, but. That's what it is. But that, that is what it is. <laughs> um, in terms of reuniting slavery disrupted branches of a family I'm tree. Um, so basically by that, what I mean is obviously when families were split apart, whether that was because they were split apart in the probate for an enslaving family, or they were actually sold. Um, like I said, it's just amazing to to finally be able to restitch all of those trees that just got broken apart, right, and sent all over. The place. Yes. So we're going to start with um, one of my favorite people. Mm -hmm. So this is indirectly going to be touching on Donnie's ancestor, Martha Brooks, and yours, and mine. Yes. Yeah, great auntie, at least. Yes. So basically, out of the blue, we got a DNA cousin yes. on Ancestry.com. Yes. And she was really excited, and we were really excited. And basically, the, the premise of it was, is, well, I believe my ancestor, Mariah, Mariah Brooks, is actually the Mariah Brooks who came from Edgefield. So part of the problem was... And, First of all, I'd just like to, to really, really thank Rashawn um, because she just gave such excellent information in, in the, the message that she sent me. And I'm sure she did She the same called thing, me. Or she called you. Well, she laid it out. She's like, I'm the daughter of, they're the children of, they're the children of. And mm -hmm. she went all the way back to Mariah. Because I'm going to be really honest, most people who contact me on Ancestry do not do that. No, they do not. They just say, oh, I think we may be related or, you know, I'm the, the child, I'm the descendant of. Right. They don't really explain how they think their ancestor fits our ancestors. Right. And, you know, you know, with any place, especially like Edgefield or the parts of Virginia or parts of North Carolina, it can get really complicated. So with what actually threw me in the beginning was because she had laid it out, I put it all in my tree exactly the way that she did it, and then I went looking for the records. Mm -hmm. And I was finding all the records, but they all said that Mariah was, was from born, Mississippi. Was born in Mississippi. Mm -hmm. And that was really, really throwing me. At first, I was thinking, mm, I'm not really sure if this is the Mariah that came from Edgefield. Right. Until I actually, and this again is why it's really important to look at every single record. Don't just save it, open it up and just literally look at every piece of information. Right. And it wasn't until I was actually speaking with you on the phone that the penny dropped and it's like, oh, wait a minute. Mariah never gave that information on the census return. Her, Her husband, husband did. Gave Her the husband. information. Right. So that was problem number one, because basically in genealogy, when things aren't, line, when things aren't lining up the way that they should do, if you have a question, that needs to be answered. Right. So we were chatting, and how old was Mariah when she was sold? Um, I don't know the age, but I do know that she had two children. Mm -hmm. So she had Rob and Henry. Can you um place that picture that we sent to you up, please? So she had two children. Right. So if you look at the bottom, you see Maria, Rob, and Henry, and then you see Martha. This is a um the Edgefield, South Carolina slave record book. And basically in this book, at the very bottom is Martha, which is my great grandmother, who was sold to Lemuel Brooks. And this was done in 1857. And then you have Maria, Robin Henry right over top of her. And she was sold to a John Wilkerson, also 1857. They, this was the last time they saw each other. 
This was about 163 years ago. So just let that sink in for a Yeah, minute. I'm going to let y'all take that in. That so, was 163 years ago. Rashawn, Rashawn is contacting two of her cousins, right. Uh, us. Right. And our lines hadn't been united. The, the last time that Mariah would have seen her, her sister Martha was 163 years ago. Right. That's powerful. Yeah. So, <laughs> and it was so funny because... Rashana talked to me about two or three years ago because she was also on 23 and me. Oh, right. And when she talked to me on 23 and me, 23 and me, she didn't know how we were related. So when she called me, she was like, I have, when she called me, I was doing some overtime at work and I was like, hello. And she said, Hi, I spoke to you a couple of years ago, and I wanted to let you know, I didn't know then, but I know now how we're related, and she just went straight into it. Didn't give me the opportunity to say, well, I'm at work right now. Not that it mattered, because I was overtime, so nobody was there. Nobody, you know, it didn't really matter, but she just went straight into it. More than likely, John Wilkerson was the reason why Mariah slash Maria was, um, Take them Mississippi. taken to Mississippi. That's probably, that is how she, not probably, that's how she got there. So um, when we sat there and we talked about it, she didn't know about um, the slave record book. So she had Henry. She had already had Henry on her list. She didn't have Rob. So she was like, that's another child. And I'm like, yeah. She said, okay. And um it just hit me then the type of work that we do and I had to post it. So some of you who are already on my page, I had to post that. I was like, look, I know I cuss and I fuss about genealogy all the time. I mean, and y'all know I cuss and I fuss. Can't stand these people. It's like they get on my nerves. But I'm telling you, I love genealogy so much because you can't, you can't find that kind of excitement when you know that you've connected a family after 163 years, you brought that family back together and, and you, you've had that type of help from your ancestors. Like, mm -hmm. cause Martha makes it possible for me. I know she like, she stays on one shoulder and my grandmother stays on the other. My, I, I don't, my 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 mother's mom, she stays on the other. They they stay with me at all times. So, you know, kudos to them. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and to be able to answer some of Rashawn's questions, mm -hmm. make that connection, mm -hmm. and give her your you know your knowledge about how you think now Mariah and Martha mm -hmm. fit within the overall Brooks family. So again, she'll need to see if she actually matches Brooks's right. with the way that you do. Right, right. So once, you know, but the thing is, is that because she matches me, she's going to match them. I mean, it's... That's true. Well, unless they were half-sisters. Unless we, they were half-sisters, right. Yeah. That we don't know at the moment. Right. <clears throat> but we'll find out. Mm -hmm. So again, it's just um, just one of those little kind of genealogical kind of best practice things I wanted to touch on because initially there were just a couple of clashes in terms of information. As I said, because it really did throw me that every record kept saying that she was born in Mississippi. It's like, no, they should be saying that she's born in South Carolina. Yeah. And then you saw records that I didn't see. And then all of a sudden it was saying that she might have been born in Virginia. And, and then South Carolina. South Carolina. She had everything. She had everything. Yeah, she had everything. Lisa, Lisa Way said genealogy is very intense, but I love it too. And it is intense. And that, just that moment, when when I was showing her the slave record book, she she felt the intensity herself because all she could say was, wow, wow. You know, that was the last time that those two sisters saw each other because right at that moment when I showed her that, then I told her to turn two pages over and then she saw the entire family. So at that point she saw her the, the mother, the father, the rest of the siblings, and all she could say was, wow, you know, it's just wow. So have we found other siblings for Martha? 
Well, yes, we have, but we haven't found the descend the descendants. Right. And so I'm looking forward. It it gives it gives you the it gives you the excitement of okay, well, if I found if we found the descendants for this person, we can find the descendants for the rest of them. That's what Black History Month is about to yeah. me. It's a and, and that's why we're talking about this today, because we we are able to bring back families that or reconnect families that have been disconnected all these years because of this thing called slavery. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's just been an awesome, it's been an awesome journey for me. And again, we were very fortunate that we were speaking with and interacting with a cousin who had already, who had already done the research, who had done the research, right. who had a family tree that we could actually refer to. We could take a look at the records that right. were on that tree and just basically was getting over that final hurdle. Yes. Yes. To say, yep, the two of them were sisters. Yes. So it's real nice when they do the work too. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's real nice when they do All the work. Right. And well, especially again, considering her family in Mississippi, there's a lot of repeating names. Right. So if I was doing it from scratch, it would have taken me so, so much longer much to work longer. through because you know you could have three Charlottes who all have the same name born right. around the same time, but because she had literally laid it out, right. You just literally just had to take pick up what she what she gave us, right. and kind of run with it. And then the other thing about Martha is that my mom's DNA, because my mom my mom has an Eve like you know, DNA, she connects to everybody. Oh my God. Juanita, she connects to everybody. So because she connects the way that she does, my mom has a huge connection of DNA in Louisiana. And I, to this day, have no idea why. And um, it could, it could go two ways. It could go because of Martha or it could go because of the Georgetown 272. And I have, I, I just don't know what it is, but she connects deep south and she connects South Carolina. And it's, it's. Okay, you also have Matthews slash Mathis. And oh yeah, they, he did have a rack of kids too, didn't he? He had a rack of kids. It's a huge family, both on the black and the white side. And they're in Louisiana, Mississippi, Arkansas, Missouri, just throughout the slave holding south. Yeah, I had too many babies. Mm -hmm. Too many babies. And again, the reason why I wanted to open up with this one is, again, it dispels the notion that Black people can't do genealogy. Not that we don't have the oh capability God, yes. of doing it, but, oh, well, your, fa your family were slaves. You're never going to be able to find You're never going to be able to find, find Oh, that's that Twitter conversation. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So I wanted that? to open up on that one because, again, that was just such a, it was transformative for her. We were really excited because we found another Brooks, another Brooks sibling. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we can't do that, though. We can't do that. No, though. we can't do that. <laughs> and actually, while we're on the topic of Martha, you can talk about your discovery with this lovely South Carolina territorial state census. Yes, yes. What? 1869, is that right? So the, the census itself, first of all, I want to thank our cousin Loretta Bellamy for um, showing this to me. Thank you, Loretta. Yeah, I'm saying it sarcastically with a smile. But <laughs> <laughs> Loretta um, pointed out it's actually on the um, familysearch.org as they continue to push forward with all of the different stuff that they have, they started to digitize. This particular South Carolina census actually dates back from 1829 to 1920. So it's like almost 100 years old. And it starts showing African Americans right after the Civil War. But the date for this particular one that was found was 1869. So one of the things that we do know about Martha Brooks is that she was a breeder. Um, on that same photo that was that you guys just saw, on the far, I guess that would be the right, thank you, on um, where you can't see it, Martha was sold to Lemuel for $1,205. That is an extremely high amount. That amount lets you know that she is considered a breeder. <sighs> What is a breeder for those that do not know? And I know that sounds crazy for those that do know, but a breeder is just what you think it is. It is a 
person who was having children so that they could sell them like a dog when you or a cow or, yeah. cow or whatever animal that was bred my great great grandmother she was my two two times great grandmother she was bred and uh, she had children and they were sold out this is why she is part of the reason why my mom may have connections everywhere so um and you in keeping on that topic you've explained the whole concept of, not the concept the reality of breeding to people who had never americans who huh. had never heard of the term you've had grown men cry I, in your presence <laughs> after you've explained what it was yeah when i used to drive for uber i had um it was so sad it, it, I, he actually made me cry this is this is one white guy he got in the car with me you know as an uber driver if you've gotten in cars with uber as a rider, one of the main questions that you ask is, so what's your other occupation? What else do you do? Is this all that you do? And of course, that, that starts the conversation off. And, and I told him, oh, I do genealogy and I'm, I'm a researcher and everything. And it, it's an excellent topic. Genealogy is an excellent, oh, yeah. it's just an excellent topic. And as I was talking to him, and of course, it comes back with, well, have you found, what have you found that's interesting? And Martha was my most interesting topic. And when I told him that she was a breeder, he just kind of looked at me strange because I could see him in the rearview mirror. And he would look at me strange. And he was like, breeder? What do, you, what do you mean breeder? You mean like a breeder? Breeder, breeder? Like a breeder. And he kept repeating that. He just kept saying breeder. You mean breeder? Like a breeder, breeder. Like a breeder. And I'm like, yeah, a, yeah, a breeder. He's like, like an animal breeder? Like a breeder? And I said, yes, yes, my great-great-grandmother had babies to be sold. The man cried. I'm talking about at least 6 to about 225, 230. He bawled in the back of my car. I had to give him tissue, everything. He had no clue. He did not know. He did not understand. He was confused. He was like, I was never taught that. I didn't know anything about that. You've got to be kidding me. You know, all of that. So that's why I'm giving you this definition. This is why I'm telling you guys what it is. This is what breeding is. It's, it's That's what it was. Um. So anyway, once he got out the car, he kind of tapped on the window real quick. And he was like, can I give, can I give you a hug? I'm sorry. And I'm like, well, you didn't do it, but <laughs> okay. And I, I had to put my car in park and, and I had to, I had to kind of console this big guy because he was so hurt that so many hundred years ago, my great, great grandmother had to sell her children. And, um, but yeah, she was a breeder. Well, little t she didn't have to they were sold they were sold she her children were taken from her and what really made him i think what really made him cry is that it was her own father or own grandfather that did it so that was when it really got bad for him he was just done he was over he was over the moon and that was it for him so, so the 1869 yes. record actually had a little curveball for us. Yes. If you'd like to kind of talk about that. Yes, that 1869 record. So the way the record was set up is it only gave the um, the head of house as named. And lo and behold, living right next door to her was her sister Becky, which was great. Mm -hmm. But inside the household, the way the columns are set up, it would list males colored and, and um, white, females colored in white. In the first column, you had to be between six and 16 in order to be listed. Which is crazy because we know that Martha had children who were young, because that's what confused me so much yesterday. Yes, it did. <laughs> because I'm like, wait a minute, Martha had more kids than this. Right. But her kids were under the age of six. She had so some children that were under the age of six, so some yeah. of them were not listed. Hmm. And um, she had, we knew that in 1870, she had two sets of twin boys, one, one boy, and then an older girl. That's what we knew from 1870. So when Loretta and I first looked at this, we had to make the comparison between those two. We, looked, we took the 1869 and the 1870 census, and we were looking at it like that. Um, 
Originally, Loretta and I were confused because we thought Rebecca, her daughter, was the Becky that was living next to, door to her. But mm -hmm. Rebecca never went by Becky. So I had to send Loretta a message later on, a couple of days later, and say, oh, that wasn't Rebecca. That was her sister. So that was all cleared up. And then when I was talking to Brian about it, and I'm like, no, the two sets of twin boys that were younger weren't counted because they were under the age of six years old. Then the next column was to males 21 or older. She didn't have any males 21 or older, so she didn't have anything um, listed in that one. So let's go back. Oh, wait. And then you had the next set of columns where you had males um, total count. So you had males white and colored, females white and colored. And that was your total count. That was the last rows. So here's the kicker. Six to 16, she had two sets of boys. She had uh, two boys. That was correct. According to the 1870 census, she did have a set of boys that would have fallen in that. She also had a set of boys that would not have fallen in that because they were under the age of six. That made sense. How that was, the, matter of fact, she had three boys that would not because Peter wouldn't have fallen in yep. that as well. So that made sense. Then the 21 um, years, she didn't have any boys that would have fallen in that. But then we get to the count of how many total people that was in her house. Now, Becky was older. She fell in the female column for between, well, she didn't fall in the female column because she was older than 16 but she was under the age of 21, so she wasn't counted there. She was only counted in the total number of females in the household. So technically, in the total number, it should have said two females, five boys. That's what the total number should have said. But instead, the total number said five boys, which was correct, but then it said, five girls. That meant that she had three girls that were under the age of six. So that means that I have three more girls that I need to look for, for my great, great grandmother. But the one small consolation we have is those three girls were in Edgefield because they were in her house in 1869. Yep. So it's not like a case where they were counted and then sold. And then sold. So she had her, she had her girls. And of course, they're girls. <laughs> what am I going to do? They're girls. They got married. They got different names. You can't even do a, a broad you search. You can't on, do a broad search. Yeah, I was going to say is you can't do a broad search on women in Edgefield with the last name Brooks who may have gotten married between, say, 1875 and 1890. Because Brooks is a huge family. They're probably they already on tree. my tree. Yeah, they're probably on the tree. So, um, yeah. But that's the beauty of those kind of records is now we know for a fact that there's three girls that we have to try and figure out some way of, of trying to find them yeah. and track them down. Yeah, but the, but the good thing is is that she she has some more children that I have to look for. <laughs> so we got some questions real quick. Well, I noticed some, I don't know who asked it. Someone was asking a question about if we found people in Florida. I'm assuming they, well, they asked that question when we were talking about the um, Martha and Mariah. So while I am probably sure that there are Brooks descendants in Florida. Not we, yet, Martha. Not yet. That was Martha not that yet. asked that question. And then, um, so Latifa Joyner asks, can you explain breeders? Oh, she came late. Well, just real quick, breeders, again, are, are women who were set aside mm -hmm. to have, have a buck and they had children to be sold very, very quickly. That's, which, that's what it is. Which is how explains Martha. And mm -hmm. then we have another ancestor who was a male Lewis Matthews. Lewis Matthews. Who was also a breeder. So he was the buck. So he was the buck, and he was fathering babies all over old nine, the old, throughout the entire old ninety six district. And there is there is a story about another man 
who is a Brown, who I'm telling y'all, if anybody in my family comes across this man, do not look me up. Cause I'm not doing, I'm not doing that research. I'm telling y'all right now, I'm not doing that research. She says that now. I'm saying I'm dead <laughs> serious, Brian. I'm hiding from you. According to what I have been told, this man had fought, was the father of 100 children. With the surname Brown. Brown. Do not look me, I'm changing my phone number. The first time one of y'all call me, I'm going to change my phone number. I'm gonna change my name everything you know it couldn't have been a peterson it couldn't have been a holloway it couldn't, it couldn't have been transborn or olive or care Gilford. less brown i could care less i'm that not doing like it. one of the apart from jones and smith you brown. tricked me into moses i'm not doing it i'm telling you now <laughs> i'm not doing it 100. Look at the sense of satisfaction you have now having found all i don't have satisfaction <laughs> with moses brian i keep telling you that <laughs> you found all these kids so <laughs> I don't have any satisfaction. <laughs> I'm not doing it. 100, one, zero, zero. Not doing it. Not doing it. But yeah, I mean, yeah. Then there's another person. She said, sorry, came in late. Did these kids have same father? This is just tragic. They can't have it. No. Well, Robin Henry would have had different fathers from the rest of the children she had. I think his name was Rimmer or R Rimmel. Was that the man that she married? That Mariah Who? married? Mariah married in um, Mississippi? I, I, don't, I, think it, I, don't, I think it's Rimmel. I think it's Rimmel. But because she already had those two, Robin Henry and Edgefield. She already had them and those, they, we don't know have, who, yeah, we don't. We have no idea. We have no idea who, who their fathers were. And then she had a whole second. second and then family. the thing about Martha is that the her first set of kids, Rebecca, the two set of twin boys, my great, my great grandfather, Peter, I have no idea who their dads are. There's there's no clue. Now in 1880, there was another another daughter who was named after her, and that's where the name Yeldale came in. So in 1870, all of her children were listed as Brooks, but in 1880, they she gave them the last name Yeldale, and that's why my family goes by Yeldale. But we are actually we're not Yeldales. So we're not really sure where the Yeldell. We don't even know where from. the Yeldell surname came from, and um and we're not Yeldells. I, I mean, my family can get mad at me all they want to, but we're, we're not Yeldells. We don't even carry the Yeldell um, DNA. DNA. We we're, we we are cousins to the Yeldells. We're cousins to the White Yeldells. We definitely that. Mm. Um, but we we're not. I don't have a White Yeldell descendant, not yet. And if I do, it's so far down the line. It's not close enough for me to to know who it is. Because again, after all of these years, you know exactly what you're looking for. I know exactly what I'm looking for. You can for. compare with your, how you match white Brooks. Yep. So you know that you carry the Brooks DNA. Yep. Holloway, Matthews, yep. Peterson, Will, you just go all the way down. I go down the line. And I Yeldell is, is the one. That's the one family I cannot connect to. I'm, I, I'm not, yeah, so. It's nowhere in there. So yeah, Latifah Joyner says she thinks her third great grandfather was a buck. Yeah, could be possible. And again, that's tricky because using Lewis, as, Lewis Matthews as an example, not all of his kids carried the Matthews surname. They may not have even known that he was his father. Mm -hmm. Their mother may not have told them who their father was because it was again breeding may not have been i mean i hate to say it but may not have even some of it may not have even have been consensual yeah yeah thing. yeah um, i mean because when i wrote the book that was one of the things that i you know i found a there's a um i wish i had the book in front of me now but there there was actually a slave narrative where there was one guy who in merlin and he actually talked about how they would place them like in a stall and tell them that this is where you're going to be until you got this woman pregnant. That was that. That was it. This is where you were going to be. You'd be naked and this is where you were. And that was that. That's how they did it. Like animals. It was breeding. So for instance, one of Lewis's son, two of his sons, 
carried the name Brunson because their mother was a Brunson. They knew he was their father. No, sorry, their mother married a Brunson. So they considered their stepfather their to, be their, to be their father. Mm -hmm. So they took his name. I and mean, it's the, um, the, the joys, the stuff that we have to deal with. Right. You have to be strong to do this, you know, and, and, and that's another that's another niche towards Black History Month. The strength that comes from our our families and I'm saying families, I'm talking about both black and white. They all went through some crazy stuff and passed it down to all of us because our white family members who do this kind of work they have to they have to see this and they have to be strong enough to be able to pass it on to their black family members and know that their white families did this mm -hmm. and they have to be strong enough to say you know what i need to share this in order for you to know how we connect that's 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 a strength that we have to understand that they have to get through and then we have to be able to take it that's a strength because i'm to say the one thing i wanted to say about the names is there i have white families whose names change for different reasons nothing but nothing because of like breeding you know like for instance a lot of it had to do with inheritance so like my south carolina and georgia white um butler family so we have Major Pierce Butler, who basically, I'm not going to get into the whole story. He wasn't really happy with any of his sons, didn't think any of his sons could manage his estate. So he gave it to one of his daughter's children. So that grandson was not born a butler, but in order to inherit his grandfather's estate, he had to, had take, to take the name Butler. Okay. So, But that was by choice. Mm -hmm. So it's not like, oh, I don't know who my father is or my mother refuses to tell me who my father is or I just right. don't like how I, the circumstances behind my conception. Right. Type deal. Right. But it, it, it's just, um, I don't know. Lisa said, same in my family. We are not ways, but cousins to the ways. Ah, okay. And then we have Elizabeth Torres. She says, I hope DNA will help your search lead to cousins of descendants to Martha's girls. It will, because my mom's my mom's DNA is extremely strong. You guys have no idea when when Juanita <laughs> when Juanita's DNA popped up, she popped up related to half of Edgefield. And then she ended up also being related to my Sheila. And being related to Sheila, Sheila's DNA popped up being related to the other half of Edgefield. <laughs> So being related like that, that's when we started seeing that if you wasn't related to my mother, then you were related to Sheila. And then if you ended up being related to both my mom and Sheila, you ended up being related to all of Edgefield. So that was, those were the things that ended up happening. And I mean, we then we, at that point, we just needed to find out how. But because my mom ended up with the DNA of the Williams line, which takes us into Moses and Caroline. Um, Moses Williams is the man that found the 45, that had the 45 children that Brian bullied me into um, researching <laughs> and finding those kids. Um, and I, yes, I said bullied because he bullied me into it. And, you know, with that being said, we already know that Moses is probably the, at least he's, the grandfather of at least two thirds of that area. It's, it's without a doubt. I have no doubt in that. I could be wrong, but I doubt it. Well, Cause I mean, we just worked out the, the basic logistics, 45 kids. If we know that they were all of them probably having at least double digit kids. So let's just use the number 10, nice round, even number 10 kids say those, sorry, 45 kids say each one of those 45 had 10. 450, 450 grandchildren. 4,000. And each one of those had 10 kids. 4,500. 4, yeah. And now, just, go again. 450,000. But, but let's think, just get... People, but people might think that 10 is exaggerating. We're not exaggerating. No. And the reason why we're not exaggerating, because we've already found 20 children, and all 20 children got ten ch at least 10 children apiece. So there. <laughs> <laughs> 
we know for a fact that he already has at least 200 grandchildren. So ain't nobody exaggerating. I'm just saying. So it's not an exaggeration. So part of what Donnie and I are going to have to do to find a few, few more of the remaining children, as well as his mother and siblings, some of his siblings, some of his siblings. is going back to those original deeds that I print it off and have copies of yeah. and start working because we're getting a sense of what the family names were. Cause I mean, some lines we've traced all the way down to the present day. We have living people. We have living people. And we can see the naming patterns within the overall Williams family. So we can go back to those wills to try to figure out, Oh, well that's where the name Caroline's coming from. Yeah. Because look, there's Caroline. There's, there's Caroline. Caroline. So start stitching those kind of family stories together. Yeah. I'm going to say one of the best records that, so, you know, between deeds and enslavers, wills and probate records and mentions in books and newspaper uh, comments, one of the best record resources we found for Moses was actually the Freedmen Bureau's labor contracts, the work contracts, which are available for free on FamilySearch.org. And for Burrell, that was the and for Burrell. Burrell's but we picked up. Line. I think we picked up another, we had already had, we had already found about four or five of Moses' kids by that point. Yeah. And then we got that contract, and I think we picked up another five? Mm-hmm. About another, about another five people. Yeah. Because um, again, 40, 40 girls gives you a little bit of wiggle room, but we had, he only had five boys. Yeah. Um, so we had to be, re you know, really do the due diligence before we actually say, like, this is a son. Yeah, and, right. and, and the five boys were easier, definitely easier to find before we found the girls. Um, but the girls are, are, are coming. They're coming. Slowly. Um, as a matter of fact, well, we knew that he had a daughter called Caroline because she was mentioned in a work contract, but we, just like Mariah's kids and some of Martha's kids, mm -hmm. Wasn't really able to pick up the the, the trail the, for the her. Trail, right. A lot of that had to do with her, the fact that she was called Caroline. Mm -hmm. Caroline was a popular name. It was a popular name today. It was a popular name back then. Yep. It was definitely a popular name in, in Edgefield. Shake a tree. You've got about 2,000 Carries and Carolines all falling out of it. Especially with the last name Brunson. Mm-hmm. So didn't really get a clear picture on to be able to pick up her trail. And then lo and behold, thanks again to DNA, bam, all of a sudden got two DNA map, two DNA descendants of Caroline who ended up marrying a man called Edmund Allen. Yep. And Edgefield. Yep. Um, and they were just so, so excited to, to finally get that confirmation, understand where their family was coming from, because I think one of the DNA descendants lives in Detroit. And the other one lives, I think, I want to say California or Oregon, somewhere way out on the, the West Coast. Well, we have a couple of Moses's kids, though, because um, don't beat me up. I can't think of her name. But she contacts us a lot. And she's on both of our Facebook page. Oh, I can't, I can't think, think of her name. You know who I'm talking about, though, don't you? Mm -hmm. I can't think of her name. Just because we get so many. Because so many... we have so many, but we. We have a couple of um, Moses's family, yeah. and and we 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 are definitely connecting to his line. Oh, she gonna get me! Oh, she's, she's gonna, gonna probably get me too. She gonna but get us. In our, like I said, in our defense, he had a lot of kids. He, he has a kids. lot of descendants, and they con and a lot of his descendants contact us. He so. got a lot of kids. <laughs> so again, you know, it just it gave them the sense that they had roots. They had roots somewhere. It was a part of the country that they never ex suspected that yeah. they had roots. Yeah. Um, and again, I think a, a lot of times when people are aware that their ancestry predates a state, like what we're saying last a uh, couple of weeks ago. You know, you, your more immediate ancestry may be in Mississippi and Alabama and Florida and Georgia. And sometimes, you know, the enslaved people were shipped directly to those states and to those ports. But if you have older ancestry, it didn't start there. Mm -hmm. Louisiana maybe because it was French and then it was Spanish. I mean, that's been a slave territory for, for far longer than the, the eastern seaboard. Right. But... Always keep in the back of the mind that, that you're go you are going to have lines that will that go back right, here. right to Virginia. Yeah, everything. Virginia, Maryland. Everything started right here on the East for America. I mean, when you want to say you're American, then you need to you need to realize that you started right here 
on the eastern seaboard. This Actually, is, I need to throw Pennsylvania in that list. Oh. It, it's the it's the thirteen colonies. colonies. Yeah. That's what you you need to realize. You started when you're talking about I'm an American, then you need to think about the first thirteen colonies because that's America. Mm -hmm. Point blank, that's America. And you, all of them had slavery. That's right. And you all need to think and you need to think about that. You need to be common sense. You yes, we are all being taught what they want us to know. That's that's true. They are. But in the same instance, even we're even though we're being taught what they want us to know, part of what they want us to know is truth. Some of the stuff that they're teaching us is truth, but some of it is not. It's not all of the truth. I'm not saying that oh, it's no, a it's, lie. It's, it's, it's just it's heavily edited. It's heavy that's what it is. It's heavily edited. And you have to know that. And the only way you're going to get the rest of it is if you do your research yourself and you have to share it with your own children because that's the only way they're going to get it. Unless you fight to get it in the school systems like we need to do. And unfortunately, we aren't doing that. We're not fighting for those types of things. And a conversation that I had with um, a white cousin recently is I was trying to explain and I think she got it in the end, that African-American genealogy, especially if you come from enslaved lines, it's always bittersweet. It's never, you know, it, it is joyous and the, the aspect of reunifying lost branches and, you know, lost ancestors and family members, but it's always within the context of slavery. That's, yeah. that's the bitter part. Yeah, that's the bitter part. It is, it is. And, and it, it, it hurts and it's sad. And it took me a while to get to that point. But as my sister likes reminding me, she's like, she said that I told her something once that I was always stuck with her. Every time I can reunify a, a family that's been broken apart by slavery, I told her, it's like, I'm giving two fingers. Oh, I think I almost did it on camera. I'm giving two fingers on <laughs> to slavery. You try to, you know, basically saying that you try to strip away people's culture, history, family, names, all the rest of it. So the fact that we're doing this and that everyone out there who's researching them, especially their enslaved ancestors, is doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. we're, undo we're undoing what the enslavers tried to do. So, okay. I'm a big, I'm a big hip hop person. I I'm, I'm, a 80, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an 80s baby. Okay. And one of my favorite rappers is KRS one. Like I'm I, I love him. Him and Chuck D, even though my favorite is Dougie Fresh. So if he sees this, he knows he loves me. He knows me now. So <laughs> but yeah, my favorite is Dougie Fresh. But I am like one of the biggest fans of KRS one. And the reason being is because he's a teacher. He's a philosopher. And he he did this song called You Must Learn. And in You Must Learn, he has this quote that he says, when one, it, it I'm not saying it directly, but it, it basically goes like this. When, when one forgets about the other one's culture, ignorance swoops down and takes it away. And I'm like, Oh my God, that's like the greatest, that's like the greatest sentence in the world. And it makes so much sense. You can't just sit up here and, and not teach part of something without giving all of it because then ignorance will swoop down and make people think, oh, you didn't do anything. You're so stupid. You didn't do this. You didn't do that. You didn't, you know, all this other stuff. This is what Black History Month is supposed to be about, but to teach that other part that you're not giving. Well, again, we were talking about a heavily edited in, um, history. So again, the, the limited time that my high school spent on teaching about the Black enslaved experience in America, the picture that I had in my head was, well, all slaves did was pick cotton and pick tobacco. <laughs> no one ever said that people had, that even that enslaved people had skills. They were blacksmiths, coopers, wheelwrights, carpenters, iron, iron mongers, iron, yes. brick makers, yes. brick makers, bricklayers, architects, because, you know, 
Thomas Jefferson is like, oh, I need to have this structure built. And, well, know. they can't have those titles because they didn't go to school to do that stuff. This is true. So you can't have that title. And that's something that my mom yeah, but used how to did say. They know? I mean, did, that's what I was getting ready to get to. Because <laughs> I, be, I could be a European immigrant who knows nothing about architecture, roll off the boat, speak really good, you know, speak English speak. Very, very, very well. And, and just, you give me that title. And I black, and I black, not even give it, I take it. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I'm an architect. Yeah. Oh, where did you go to school? University of Edinburgh. Like, really, Thomas Jefferson's going to sit there, compose a letter, send it off to University of Edinburgh in Scotland. And, and ask that. Did this person actually right. graduate with it? No, he's going to take their word He's going to take their word for it. But see, my mom, and this, and see, my mom used to say, you could, you could have go to school, a, a, a white person could go to school for all of those things, be there in school for years for that stuff come out of school, hand a black person the blueprint, and then the black person never in school their life. And that black person will go and build it and put it together. Look at that blueprint and put it together. And you can't call them an architect? That doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Why? So, I mean, it's it's a lot to take in. You, Why can't you... Why, why common sense will not allow you to say there's more to them? Why won't common sense allow you to think like that? Why, why won't, what is wrong with you that you? I kind of get it. I think the realization is so horrific and it's so big that people just don't want to. Because it's a conversation that you and I had where the penny finally dropped for me why so many of our ancestors, when they were liberated, took freedom and ran with it and became teachers, doctors, lawyers, business people, farmers, entrepreneurs, all of the professions that were that were available for that time period meant that they could have done that anytime. anytime. There was nothing special about the fact that they were That's freed right. in, in 1865. It could have happened at any moment. That we were always capable. Even the first Africans of Virginia, you had one of the most famous horse breeders of his day. You had magistrates, you had business people, you had really, really wealthy, um, successful farmers. Yep. We were always able to do that. And I think that that's the horror of it, the horror of slavery that's so huge. Think about all the intellectual capital that has been lost for all time. Because someone could, someone, you know, whether they were a wheelwright or working in the field or working in the house could have had this amazing idea. But because the they were is, slaves, it never saw the light of day. But the thing is, Brian, that's when the penny, the penny drop for me was when I found out about when I started to study reconstruction, because that's what hit me. You mean tell me they was already like this? <laughs> you know, that's, that's what I was saying. You have to take a deep breath. You have to take a deep breath because they came out of reconstruct. They came out of slavery running, not even running. They were sprinting. They came out of reconstruction. They came out of slavery sprinting. And reconstruction period, that's, that scared the heebie-jeebies out of the people around them. Whether it was white or black, for that matter, those that even the even those who were not whether they were white or black, uneducated people, they were like, "Where they come from, and how they know how to do this so quickly? How in the world can you come out of slavery and become a senator? What did you? How did you? How did you do that? How in the world were you able to put up? Do y'all realize that?" During the Reconstruction period, between 1870 and I think about 18, okay, Reconstruction period ended in around 1877. Within that time period, almost all of the HBCUs were created. There are a are hundred HBCUs, almost all of them were created. I need y'all to let that sink in. Almost 100 HBCUs were created between 1865 and 1877. That is less than 20 years. 
Now, I have one story that we can think about, because <clears throat> I had never considered this before, talking about how our, our ancestors took, you know, took freedom and just ran with it. Not all of them, but, but quite a few of them. Speaking with a black cousin of mine in Kentucky, his, and his freed ancestor was, um, he, made, he did stained glass. He, you know, he's a stained glass maker, um, specific, specifically for churches. So you think about how complicated and complex yeah, that was. So yeah. he had been, you know, born in slavery, freed with everyone else in 1865. He said slavery really haunted his ancestor. His ancestor was so afraid that the federal government would change its mind because he said mm. the federal, it's not like that would have been uncommon. Think about Na the Native American experience. He wanted to make himself so indispensable to his county and his community by making these really intricate, beautiful stained glass windows for churches. That he would not be taken he, back. He would not be enslaved again. Well, they did almost try to change I, but, their mind. I mean, true, think about it. I never thought about that, that that would actually be a fear that newly, that newly freed slaves would have actually had going, wait a minute. They could just change their mind. The At any moment. The South may not decide to let things lie and try to rise again. Well, so he was right. Mm -hmm. Technically, he was right. I mean, <sighs> I, I mean, I just, you know, those are the things that you, these are the things that only genealogists, black and white, think about. This, these, this, these are the things, those that really dig into it. And, and I want our African-American genealogists to really understand what our white genealogist families, they think about this. I want them to know that. I want them to know that. I don't want, I, I don't, because I don't want my white genealogist family members to feel like they're not counted in this. I, I don't. I don't want them to I don't want them to feel like that cuz I'm gonna tell y'all something. My cousin Martha, she works her tail off for us. Oh, she does. She works her tail off for us. She helps us on a regular basis. I can I can wake up at 2, 3 o'clock in the morning and get something from Martha. Mm -hmm. Without any with Missy Price. She, she works her tail off for us. And Sharon Sharon Rowe. Oh, I wasn't, you know, I wasn't going to forget <laughs> Sharon. I mean, I mean they, yeah. they worked it. We're, when, we're blessed to have We're blessed a, to have them. We're blessed to have them. They have no problem. When I, I'm telling y'all, the first time I really noticed Sharon was when she was like, nan, nana, boo, boo. I found him regardless. <laughs> I found out how my cousin talking about her black cousin, Mandawa. I figured out how he was related without y'all help forget you yeah, that, her, that was her thought process she was like i don't need y'all just to give a little context she was not getting help from yeah she from, wasn't getting help yeah. she wasn't getting help from the families that she needed help from and she was like put on you i got it anyway and i'm ordering his kill that's how she ended it <laughs> you know, she, that's how she ended it she was like and i'm ordering his kill today so forget y'all i mean that was that was what it is do not sleep on your white relatives that are trying to help you. When they're trying to help you, they get it. They honestly get it. You have those that get it. Don't sleep on it. Don't sleep on it. Don't miss on. Don't miss out on it because whether you want to really, whether you want to realize this or not, you're you need them. You're gonna need them, and just like you need them. They need you. Don't think that, don't think it. Don't think that they don't because they do. So I don't, I don't want them to think, and y'all can get mad at me. I don't, cause you need to understand something. I take medicine that makes me feel like I don't care anymore. <laughs> so I'm at that point. I, I don't, I know what's right. I follow what's right. And the bottom line is, I know when we we need each other. That's the bottom line. We always well, need each other. I guess my viewpoint on that is I always extend an open hands without judgment. That's right. Because without again, judgment. You can't apportion blame to people who weren't alive when this happened. And the fact that, you know, they accept us as family and they're on board and they help with research. As far as I'm, you know, your family. Mm -hmm. You know, That's kind, it. Of, kind of end of story. That's it. Um, and, That's you know, it. and we're there. And we're there to support each other. Right. So let's see if we can find some questions. 
Okay. Um, my family is deeply rooted in Maryland and Virginia. This is from Hope Whitman Goddish. But I have a Smith branch of my family that started in Maryland and ended up in Kentucky. I so wonder if they were the same family. Okay, that wasn't a question. She was just talking about her. Well, one thing you might want to consider and look into, I mean, Maryland was, oh, did she say that was in the colonial period or they just started mm. in Maryland? She didn't say whether it was colonial or not. I was going to say, well, if it's the colonial period, always remember Maryland was set up as a Catholic colony. Not that everyone that lived in there was Catholic, but the majority certainly were. Um, if that's the case with your Smith family, then um, take a look in Kentucky to see if they were if they were Catholic, would be would be one thing that I suggest. Um, that's helped me with my Calvert family from Maryland, by the way. Okay. Yeah. Tiffany, our cousin Tiffany, she was um, responding, and she said, "Build the relationship to work with your black and white cousins." That's exactly right. And then she says, we can't change the past. Um, Kaylee Myatt, I hope I pronounced your, your name right, Kaylee. She says, we can't change the past, but we can control how we handle our knowledge of it and how we help each other. That's very, that's very true. Because actually I can think of one instance where our Edgefield DNA solved a mystery on the white side of the family, and that's with the, the Culpepper family. You know, we have Culpepper's thanks to the Mr. James Shepherd. He's got Culpepper in his line, mm -hmm. plus one of his wives was a Culpepper. There was a huge mystery over who his father was. And did they thank you? He did. Oh, actually. that's good. Because I can think of several times where our <laughs> DNA has um helped several mysteries and they locked their trees. I mean <laughs> Oh no, they were because this is something that is that the Shepherd family has wondered about for over 175 years. Oh, okay. where did we come from? They, everyone awesome. knew that they came. We came from Virginia, but they didn't know. There was no indication who the the earlier ancestor was, and because even though we picked up that endogenous um, DNA, there weren't really any other Shepherds kind of coming in. Mm -hmm. They were on the more distant side of the family, so we kind of had a cl a clean kind of. Culpepper line coming in. And um, we just looked at who I was matching. We looked at who you were matching. And it's like, oh, okay, yeah, there's another James. Okay. And once we got him, boom. Oh, went, so my, my mom or me? Your mom. Okay. Because we needed to match everybody. <laughs> but as soon as we worked that out, boom, we just leapfrog about another nine nine generations. Yeah, because... I want y'all to know my my little Russ Parr rant that I did just now. It 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 was for us on a positive side, but it was also on that negative side because you still have those who will lock their oh, tree yeah. and will shut it down. And so that was for them to hear too. Those that will lock their tree. Well, to that, all I have to say is you missed we, out. We, actually, we don't <laughs> need to see your trees because as a habit. We may look at someone's tree just to get an idea for what records they may have or for clues. We don't save anything from their tree. No, we don't. But you know what? We have other ways. It's always another way. We don't need your tree. Nope, nope, nope. But again, it sounds as though we're exaggerating, but this seems to be more com more common occurrence for us with our um, white South Carolina cousins. As soon as they start seeing like Donia, me, and a handful of other oh, they black, shut it down. Uh, black cousins, those trees are shut down. They shut it down. Instantly. Yeah, because we, we, let me see, who is it? Bernice, myself and Brian, um, Loretta, mm -hmm. now Hamad. Hamad. They see yeah. those names, they shut it down. You see the name, then they see our little faces. Mm -hmm. and like, they shut it down. They don't, like, they don't want to, they don't want to do it. They don't want to do it. They don't, Natan, they mm -hmm. don't want to do it. They shut it down. But the interesting thing, especially on um, my Facebook, my Facebook timeline feed, I'm seeing more stories about how white Americans are either finding out that they have trace amounts of sub-Saharan African and kicking around in their DNA, or they find out that they are related to people of color. Um, and they meet, you know, I, of course. Not from Edgefield. Not from Edgefield. <laughs> well, actually, funny that the last three I've seen have all been from Virginia, to, yeah. be, to be perfectly honest. But it's kind of heartwarming to see. Um, you know, they 
And of course, newspapers are going to cover the most positive stories. You know, they're not going to really cover the negative ones. But still, it's nice to, it's just nice to see that it the, is. the it hand is. is being outreached and people are meeting and exchanging information and working on their family history together. It is. It is really nice to see that. And um, Katrina Rose says, I'm researching Ellison's, oops, went up. And I'm getting DNA connections with white cousins from Charleston and Edgefield County area. My great grandfather was born in Louisiana, but I can't figure out how he got there. You can't figure out how he got to Louisiana or to the Edgefield, South Carolina area. Because I was going to say Charleston was a huge slave shipping yes. port. Yes. So. And not only was Charleston was this slave shipping port, you had a lot of the people that went to that port and then was walked to Edgefield and mm, sold. Yeah. So that that that's one of the ways that he might have got to Louisiana. That yeah. that we might have just solved your his, your mystery. <laughs> um, so that's that. And then Tracy Gaines said, "I had a white relative who was mean to me. For one year, she wouldn't speak to me. Once her son's DNA came back matching to our black relative, she called me and told me we had her great great great." great grandparents in common i knew it was through slavery so now she's helping me the mcgee family owned many slaves well good I mean, i'm glad she's helping you i've had well i told you the story i had someone from edgefield south carolina ask me to remove my family line from her fam from the family tree tiffany you got people harassing you you want me to beat them up she says, she, I'm playing, I'm playing, I'm playing, y'all, I'm playing. <laughs> um, she said, I shut my tree down because I was being harassed by people from Facebook who would come to Ancestry DNA to find me and harass me. So as of right now, I do not have a tree up. And Katrina responded. Oh, just to make that clear, what Donnie and I are saying is the trees that were shut were public to begin with. And as soon as they saw that they matched people of color, they just yeah, shut them. Yeah, 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 we did that. Katrina said, I can't figure out how he got to Louisiana from South Carolina. Yeah, we just solved your issue. Because then it, it was probably, he probably some somehow or another, he may have been a descendant of one of those who came in on that port this, through Charleston. And he could have been walked that 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 ancestor could have been sold from Edgefield or something to that nature something something in around that way my advice would be if you already know that you had that they may have had a footprint in Charleston take a look at those slave take, ship, yeah. slave shipping manifests from Charleston to Louisiana right right i mean i believe you can get those on the south carolina state archives right if that's wrong, if anyone knows the correct correct one for that, please. Um, yeah, please, please put comment. post it on the, on this comment site. Um, oh no, it is because I got loads of shipping manifests for Pierce for um for Pierce Butler for Pierce Butler. Right. So it is. It's the South Carolina State Archives. Um. So yeah, I mean, the bottom line is is that we we have to work together in order. Black History Month should teach us to work together. Um, it, it should also teach us that people of color have done so much more than what you know. You shouldn't just take February, the month of February, to learn that. So we there are so many pages on Facebook, so many um, websites that are out there to let you know that. Well, I was also going to say that's one of the powerful takeaways that I had from Catherine Knight's book, Unveiled. Yes. Because, I mean, I knew bits and pieces about the first Africans of, um, of Virginia. Yes. But when I actually learned what they did in Jamestown and how they saved Jamestown, because they basically had skills that the, the colonists didn't, didn't, have. Have, didn't have. When I sat down and I thought about it, it's like, well, if they're just grabbing poor people off the streets of London or Norwich or wherever they grabbed them from in England, shove them on a boat, send them over here. Oh, you're going to be our four, you know, our vanguard for our, for our new colony in Virginia. They didn't know how to farm. They're, they didn't know how to raise animals. They weren't 
iron workers or wheelwrights or any of that kind of stuff. Those were all skills that those Africans brought in. And really, if it weren't for them, and I kind of get why that part of the history has been edited, if it hadn't been for them, Jamestown would have died out. Right. That's it. That would have been failure number two or three for the English. There's no telling that if they would have ever tried to set up another colony again, at least in Virginia. Right. I mean, you know, the one in New York and Massachusetts and whatnot were, were going all right. Right. Karen says that she says she's biracial, Karen Bertram. She says she's biracial. My husband is white. My eldest son gets very upset when I talk about my line having been slaveholders. He hates that history. He he needs mm, he needs to know it. He needs to know it. She, and then she says, on top of it, it is not just a single line, but several on the white side. I don't I don't even know how to answer that. It would probably be easy. Well, it wouldn't be easier. It would probably be more straightforward if it was taught honestly in schools. But you know, to say that that's woven into the fabric of this country and that he's not alone they're alone. we're tech you know as much as we're descendants of the enslaved we're, we're descendants, descendants of the enslavers yeah we too. are yes we are um apart from which also being descended from from free people of color who themselves some of the some of whom were themselves enslavers i don't think i'm a i don't have i, am. I don't have free people I of color not I yet definitely am. i don't think i have them yet Oh, you do? Who? If you're a descendant of Lewis Matthews. I'm a descendant of Lewis, that's right. And I'm um, Martha Bottoms. And Martha Bottoms, that's Bottom, right. Bottoms are free. It's too many of them, so. <laughs> <laughs> so that, would, that was probably one of the toughest nuts to get my head around was that free people of color owned, actually were enslavers too. And, not, and they didn't always just enslave their family members. Right. Because you can imagine someone got manumitted, which is a fancy way of saying they were freed by their, by their enslaver. They had enough money to be able to buy not all of their family, but slowly and gradually buy them. Mm -hmm. And because the wonderful state of Virginia made it, they basically gave you a choice. After 1805, if we free you, you have one year to, to leave the state or you're gonna be re-enslaved again. Wow. That that was the law. Wow. Um so some so sometimes economically they had to keep their members and family members enslaved. Wow. Wow. Which is why again you start seeing free people of color in Virginia start moving into places like Ohio. So they're like, well look, it ain't worth it. We're just gonna we're gonna buy the freedom of as many. You know, we're gonna buy as many of our family members as we can, and then we're heading out either Jesus to North Carolina Christ. or Ohio. Yeah, 1805 is when that statute hit. Jesus Christ! <laughs> One of the best things that I love about genealogy is you literally learn something new every single, not just day, every minute. As long as I have been researching, I never knew that. I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. So if you were free before 1805, it didn't impact you. If you were freed after 1805, you had a year. Wow. Mm -hmm. Martha said, I recently came across a Brooks family who came to Marion District, South Carolina, free people of color. Wow. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. And they might be a part of us, Martha. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> Again, Brooks is just one, like Williams and Jones and all the rest of them. Um, it is a hard name because it's a common name. Because it's a common name. It's a very right. common name. So. Right. Because we know that we have at least five different William family group in Old Edgefield. And they are, if you look at the males, Y haplo groups, right. they are all distinctly different. Right. And then I like Sharon um is 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 a Brooks descendant, but it's not through Preston in her. Right. So she's Esau or something mm -hmm. like that, but that's not through Preston, Brooks, or anything like that. Well, again, I've got a whole line of Quaker Brookses, some of whom went to Abbeville. Not the same family. Not the same family. Not the same family. I think that's Sharon's family. Right. I actually think that's Sharon's family. So um, but 
she said that she said they are related to a DNA match of hers. Okay. But I think Martha's related to my my Brooks is I don't know. We'll have to see about that, Martha. But I don't know. Um I think as far as, you know, Black History Month, we're you know, we're talking about our enslaved families. So if you have some enslaved families that you want to ask questions about and how they how how you've connected some of your families, you know, let us know and and give us some of your stories because we've definitely shared ours and Whoops. how we're proud of them and we want to hear your stories and you know let us know where you are. That's where we what we're doing for Black History Month today. And we we're always checking in with the comments. We always get a notification. Yes, yes. We are swiftly running out of time. And I was going to say, if you would like to introduce talk about it next week. Next week, finally, Mr. Mac is coming. Mr. Mac Morris. He's he's um coming in, Morris Mac, and he is going to talk about his experience as um on the railroad in Norfolk. So Mr. Mac was a part, he worked there, I think, in the 60s. So he was a part of some of the first African Americans working on the railroad um, with the, you know, coming in in Virginia, still in a very racist time period. Well, it'll be interesting to talk to him about the difference between what the Pullman porters, that kind of generation of railroad workers had. Yes, and he was also one of the ones that was working on the line and right. putting the tracks down. Oh, so he was a lineman. He was a lineman. Got it. He was a lineman. And he's going to, you know, be talking about the lines and being able to, he was one of those very educated ones, and he was 30 of them, and how he was fired three months before he was able to pull his retirement. He's going to tell his story. So he's very nervous. So I want you guys to definitely welcome him. Um, I mean, he's very nervous. He's excited, but he's nervous. <laughs> Beautiful man. He's absolutely gorgeous. I love him to death. I love talking to him. I met him. He works at the DAR with me. And um, he's awesome. He's an awesome guy. So definitely welcome Mr. Mac you guys next week and he's going to be the last one on our show and then we're going to start our women's history month in march so mm -hmm. really looking forward to looking that. looking forward to that one so um are we yeah okay so i'm donya i'm brian thank you for spending your sunday with us and we'll see you next week 4 p.m eastern standard time yes i hope you guys enjoyed this show and if you have any other questions please Feel free to leave the comments and we'll see you guys later. And we'll all, you know, we'll come in back to the comments and answer anything. So, see you next week. Bye. All right. Bye bye.